Hi everyone, my name is Leila Mahmood and welcome to the third webinar of this series focusing on the fundamentals of rate transient analysis. Now in previous webinars we've had a look at traditional methods of analysis as well as pseudo steady state inflow equation and type curves. In today's webinar, we will introduce the concept of diagnostics in production data analysis when you're using type curves. When you have bad data, you get bad interpretations, and I will present the type of bad data that you should be looking for. We'll also cover the theory behind the flowing material balance and multi-phase flowing material balance, and have a look at the application of them in our Harmony Enterprise software. Let's first take a look at some diagnostics in production data analysis using type curves. Now, when we're analyzing data, in order to get reliable results, what we recommend doing is building a story. And what we do is we start off with diagnostics. Diagnostics is data validation and reservoir signal extraction using data charts and type curves. And we would recommend doing this right at the beginning so you know the kind of data that you're working with. Next up, we have interpretation, and this involves flow regime identification, estimating reservoir characteristics and identifying important system parameters. And also you're trying to qualify any uncertainty. And we do this by using traditional methods such as decline curves and static material balance, etc. Your type curves such as your Fetkovich, your Blassen game, Agarwal Gardner, and your flowing material balance. We can then move on to do modeling and history matching. And this includes validating interpretation, optimizing solution, and enabling additional flexibility and complexity by using analytical and numerical models. Now you can see that interpretation and modeling have forward and backward arrows. This is because these can be done multiple times until you get a model that you're happy with. And finally, you have forecasting, and this is where you can forecast things like your reserves and you can optimize your scenarios. So starting off with diagnostics, we start our analysis by diagnosing our data. This is something that you'd like to do right at the start. We know that no matter which analysis we use, if we analyze bad data, we get bad results. So through adequate diagnostics, we, we can verify the changes in our pressure and rate correlations. And we can see if the trend in the rate and the pressure is consistent, and that can enable us to identify things like outliers. Now here you can see an example of a gas well. From this well, we can see the behavior of the rates and the pressures. We can see from here in the squares that the changes in rate and pressures do not correlate. So it would require further information to understand if this is data that we will trust before we can take this data forward and apply different concepts of superposition and all the other great tools that we have. We'd like to filter this questionable data out as this portion of the data might not be as trustworthy as the rest of the data. And for data validation, we do have some great tools in the software, tools such as data diagnostics and type curves. So the next step is looking at diagnostics on a log log plot. We're going to be learning a lot about the flow regimes and qualitatively what's going on with the data, because there's a pattern recognition on a log log plot that you can't just get on a linear plot of production data and pressure. For instance, the downward concavity, which indicates boundary dominated flow, is very clear on this plot and the upward concavity indicates transient flow on the left-hand side of the plot. Now, in an ideal world, all the data should fit nicely on this type curve plot, but in reality, this doesn't always happen, so we can use diagnostics to help us to explain what causes this. Now, we're going to start by looking at the material balance diagnostics, and the reason they're called material balance diagnostics is because they're going to happen over a long period of time and in the long term data sets where we have boundary dominated flow. So if I have my unit slope and the unit slope will represent volumetric depletion. This is the homogeneous reservoir behavior. It will be the harmonic stem for a constant rate solution. And in order to do this properly, you have to plot the normalized rate versus the material balance time on the type curve. Now what we can see is similar to the Blassingame style type curve, and we can simply take the Blassingame type curve, plot the data, and see if the data matches the volumetric slope, or we can call it the homogeneous reservoir. If it does, we would have volumetric depletion, 
And if the data doesn't match, in this illustration, we can see that we have a couple of options. The data can actually deviate from the homogeneous reservoir, either upwards or downwards. If the data deviates upwards, this indicates we have a reservoir with pressure support. So in other words, we would not be draining a closed tank. We would be draining a system that has some sort of influx that would be affecting the boundary. Now, if we take a look at the deviation downwards, this represents a leaky reservoir, which means interference. Both of these cases are very common and the diagnostics are going to be powerful as we can immediately identify whether they are occurring or whether we have volumetric depletion. Another area of interest is the productivity diagnostic. Now these are more short term and they help us to identify more short term effects. So again, we can see the production type curve here and the sort of things that we're interested in here are the well cleaning up where the signal will deviate massively from the curve. Another diagnostic that we can identify is liquid loading, and we will see this more so in low rate wells like tight gas wells or conventional gas wells. In liquid loading, you get a fall off that looks similar to interference, but it's caused by something completely different. What causes liquid loading is basically a buildup of water or condensate in the well bore, which causes an additional pressure loss, which starts to increase with time. This additional pressure loss causes the fall off in either rates or pressures, which gives us that signature. Some other things that are commonly seen are if you get parallel trends in the data, which could represent some shift or step changes in the productivity, such as work over or tubing change. And the final one in the illustration is increasing damage. And this is much more difficult to identify because it happens a lot slower in time. Now the next section is transient flow diagnostics. Here are things that happen because of operational phenomena or dynamics that happen inside or near the well bore. Transient diagnostics are going to be things that happen early in time, but with low permeability reservoirs, they may take a very long time to happen. So they're becoming a lot more important than they used to be. So firstly, looking at radial flow. In a conventional reservoir, it's expected to see radial flow in any vertical and fractured well that produces from a medium to high permeability reservoir. And on a type curve, as you can see on the slide, the data will concave upwards and the severity of the concavity would depend on whether the well is damaged or not. If it's a very damaged well, we can see the curve below produces at a lower rate, so it will tend to become flatter at the beginning, providing us with the signature that we can see on the graph. Next, looking at transitionally dominated flow. This would occur, for example, in a vertical well that's drilled in a channel or even a reservoir where you may have radial flow at the beginning and then quickly begins to hit the boundaries on the side of the channel and then turns into linear flow in the late time. So these are just some of the things that diagnostics on type curves can help you to uncover. And the final diagnostic that's important is bad data diagnostics. Bad data may be bad if it's measured in the wrong location. Usually, for onshore wells, the production rates are pretty good quality, but the flowing pressures can sometimes be a little bit questionable. So one place where mistakes with flowing pressures could be made is where we take the measured pressure and convert it into calculated pressure. So our flowing pressures may be measured up the wellhead, but we have to convert them using a nodal analysis tool. And we have to calculate the pressure losses in the well bore so that we can convert them to bottom hole or sand face pressures. Now, when we do this, some mistakes could be made. For example, the tubing sizing could be too large, the initial pressure could be too high, the well bore correlations could perhaps underestimate the pressure loss, or vice versa. And in this case, on the type curve, we can see the data deviating from the slope as shown on the slide. So let's jump into the Harmony Enterprise software and take a look at some examples of diagnostics on type curves. In particular, we're going to be taking a look at pressure support and liquid loading. Now we've jumped into the software to take a look at some examples of diagnostics on type curves. And we're going to start off with taking a look at an example of pressure support. Now, the first thing we do when we analyze any well in the software is take a look at the diagnostics. And I've navigated to the diagnostics tab here in the software. Now this is a gas well and the engineers that were studying it suspected that there was an aquifer, but they're not really that sure or certain what's happening with this well. So what can we see on our diagnostics plot here? We can see the gas rate in red and we can also see our tubing pressures here in blue. 
Now in the software, if you initially had surface flowing pressures, the good thing is that you can quickly convert these down to our bottom hole flowing pressures. And that conversion calculator is actually built into the software. So we can see the result of that on our diagnostic plot. And we can see the result of that here in blue with our sand face pressures also being plotted on the diagnostic plot. And that's what we're going to be using for all of our interpretation. So let's start off with our analysis. And we're going to start off with creating a blasting aim type curve. I'm just going to create a new worksheet and I'm going to create that blasting aim type curve. Now we can see that we have some noise here, but the point is to match the data to our unit slope. And when I do that, we can see that not all of the data points match the unit slope. We have that slight deviation towards the right of the slope here. So chances are that we have a case of pressure support. It's important that you don't start to match the second part or that pressure support deviation part to your unit slope, as that's actually incorrect. What you're really seeing here is pressure support. And that's why you get the signature of it deviating from the unit slope. When I select my automatic type curve selection, this will give me my area in acres and it will generate out my bulk reservoir parameters. Now we have a couple of type curves that are good to help us identify these diagnostics. In this case, there was actually an aquifer that was affecting this well. And for that, we actually have a type curve. So if I select my water drive type curve this time, I can create a water drive blasting aim type curve. Now this blasting aim type curve is going to indicate the strength of the aquifer and the mobility ratio. The closer that the data is to the red diagnostic line, this means we're going to have a very small aquifer or an aquifer that has very small mobility. Whereas if the data lies closer to the blue diagnostic line, this indicates the size of the aquifer is quite large and a big mobility ratio. In this case, the data points lie pretty much on the red diagnostic line. And if I automatically type curve select those, you can see that I have a very small mobility ratio and the size of the aquifer is very small. Now, if I just go back to a blasting game type curve that I created before, we can see that on the left hand side here, we have the option of pseudo steady state water drive. And what this is, this is a Fetkovich water drive where the aquifer is assumed to be in pseudo steady state and depleted according to the material balance equation. And when I select to turn on this pseudo steady state water drive, if you take a look at the data points, what this does is it brings the data trend back into line and it gives us a more realistic estimation of what the gas in place is. So if I just turn that off, you can see that the data is deviating because of that pressure support. But if I turn that on, you can see that the pseudo steady state water drive brings the data back into line. So this helps us to get a more realistic estimation of what our gas in place is. Now the second diagnostic that we're going to take a look at is liquid loading. Now this time, this is a vertical tight gas well and we have around two or three years of production history. And here we can see our gas rate, our tubing pressures and our sand face pressures on this diagnostics plot. Let's go ahead and do some analysis, starting off with the blasting aim type curve. Now again, we have quite a lot of noise here, but the point is to match the data on the unit slope. So when I do this, we can see that this well is definitely in boundary dominated flow and we can get an area of around 19 acres. Now this analysis is done by totally ignoring liquid loading. We would always recommend taking a look at your raw data in your diagnostics before conducting any sort of analysis. In this case, we'll take a look at the liquid loading. Now there are two important data diagnostics to identify if we have liquid loading. And these are the Coleman rate and the Turner rate. Now I'm going to create a brand new plot in my diagnostics and I'm going to do that by deselecting everything, placing time on my x-axis and I'm going to place my gas rate on my y-axis. I'm also now going to place my Coleman rate or Turner rate on my axes. 
and these are going to help me to identify if I have liquid loading or not. Now there's around a 20% difference between the two of them, so I'm just going to select to turn on my turner rate. And you'll notice that the units for both my gas rate and my turner rate are the same. So I can easily simply just link these two together. So I'm making an apples to apples comparison here. Now I can take a look at my gas rate as compared to my turner rate. Now we can see that at the beginning of production here, my turner rate is below my actual rate. So that means that I don't have any liquid loading here. As we continue producing, we can see here that we have some overlapping between the gas rate and the turner rate. And if the actual gas rate is below the turner rate, that's when we start to see liquid loading. So what the turner or Coleman rates actually represent is if the gas rate that we have here is actually good enough to lift a particle of liquid up from the sand phase up to the surface. Looking at this later part of data, we can see that a lot of the turner points are overlapping the gas rate, so we're at a higher risk of liquid loading here. Now let's go back to our blasting aim type curve, and I'm going to create another type curve. And this time we're going to consider the liquid loading effects. Now to help you to identify liquid loading, first thing we'd want to do is perhaps filter our data. And what we can do is use the little filter funnel here, and we have a magic wand within our filter funnel. And you can see when I select that, we actually have a liquid loading filter. And what this will do when I apply that, you can see that it's actually cleared out or made white some of those data points. And that's going to help me to avoid misinterpreting the data. And when I apply those, you can see that some of the noise has been cancelled out. So now I can go ahead and match my data on my type curve. And you can see when I match my data this time, I have a much higher area, a much higher drainage area of 32 acres. So you can see the difference before and after liquid loading. The area was 19 acres before I considered the liquid loading effects. Now, after considering the liquid loading, you can see that I've got a much higher area of 32 acres. So looking at the more reliable data, I've got an original gas in place of around 2 BCF. Whereas when I was looking at the data before, you could see that I had an original gas in place of only around 1 BCF before. So RTA helps you to uncover these diagnostics in your data by identifying what is the good data and what is the bad data. Now looking back at the story that we were building, once we've done our diagnostics and we've determined that we trust the data, we go into the next step and this is interpretation. Things we want to find out through interpretation will be flow regime identification and estimating the reservoir characteristics. Now the interpretation will help us have a sense of our drainage area or our initial contracted area and our initial fluids in place being gas, oil or water and we can evaluate these through the use of the flowing material balance. We can also identify if our well is in transient flow or in boundary dominated flow and we can also start having an estimate of reservoir characteristics such as permeability, skin and fracture half length and this can all be done using type curves. So now moving on to take a look at the flowing material balance, also known as the FMB. We'll look at the theory behind the FMB and even the advancements of the multi-phase FMB. So what is the flowing material balance? The flowing material balance is a way of determining the original oil or gas in place without shutting in the well. There are some obvious advantages of using the FMB to other methods. The FMB is a practical alternative to conventional material balance as it does not require the well to be shut in and so there's no well downtime. The data is very inexpensive to collect as it should be being collected as part of good production practice. Also, the flowing material balance works well for lower permeability systems and this is because when we flow a well for a reasonable amount of time, there's a good chance that stabilisation is reached and so we don't need to shut in the well and lose production. Even if the reservoir is not in a stabilised condition, regardless of the permeability of the system, the FMB can provide an idea of the minimum gas or oil in place and a current contacted drainage area.
So first of all, let's take a look at what the pressure profile looks like when a well is flowing. And this is really the basis of the flowing material balance. We can't, of course, measure the average reservoir pressure while the well is flowing. We can only measure the pressure at the well bore. However, based on the flowing pressure and the rate the well is producing at, we can infer what the average reservoir pressure is. And this is really what the flowing material balance is all about. Now looking at the required conditions for the FMB. To do this, we can make a comparison with the conventional material balance we already know. The build-up required for conventional material balance requires that we have a shut-in pressure that's at stabilised conditions and representative of average reservoir pressure. The same principle applies to flowing material balance, except we're not shutting the well in. Stabilisation occurs while the well is flowing, and we need to flow the well long enough and use the data that is representative of stabilised flow. The length of time required for this is based on the hydraulic diffusivity and is determined by permeability, porosity, viscosity and compressibility. So what do we mean by stabilised flow? Really what this comes down to is a concept called boundary dominated flow which we've looked at in a previous webinar. This is the same thing as pseudo steady state or tank type depletion and these different descriptions can be used interchangeably. Now, boundary dominated flow is what occurs in the reservoir once all the transient behavior has disappeared. We have produced the well long enough that all the transients have disappeared by reaching all the boundaries. Depletion thereon is dominated by boundaries. A great way to distinguish the difference between transient and boundary dominated flow is to think of the following analogy. Imagine a lake and you throw a rock into the middle of it. What you then see are the ripples moving out towards the bank of the lake. This is like putting the well on production, which causes pressure transients to move out into the reservoir. As long as the pressure transient or ripples haven't hit the edges of the reservoir or the banks of the lake, then the reservoir is in transient flow. As soon as the edges of the reservoir or banks of the lakes have been reached, the transient flow ends and you're now in boundary dominated flow. So the transient flow gives us information on permeability and skin and is a function of time. Boundary dominated flow, on the other hand, gives us information on the volume of gas or oil in place in the reservoir. Now, the flowing material balance can be applied to both gas and oil reservoirs, but it's easiest to illustrate a generalized flowing material balance equation by first looking at oil. We'll then move on to how we do it for gas later. So to start this off, we're first going to look at the equation of the boundary dominated flow for an oil reservoir. What this equation is, is a pressure drop from initial conditions in the reservoir to the wellbore flowing pressure. This overall pressure loss consists of two separate components. The first is a pressure drop due to depletion, and the second is a pressure drop due to reservoir flow or Darcy flow. The depletion pressure loss is a function of time, while the Darcy component is constant with time. Part of this boundary dominated flow equation is time dependent. In order to remove this time dependence, we notice that flow rate times time is equal to the cumulative production. So we make this simple substitution and now we have a boundary dominated flow equation that doesn't have a time relationship. It also turns out that this equation is applicable to both constant rate and variable rate production. And this was done by simply dividing both sides of the equation by Q. The next thing we need to do is rearrange the equation in a form that can be easily plotted. To do this, we take the time independent boundary dominated flow equation and multiply both sides by Q over delta P and divide by B pseudo steady state. And then we rearrange. This gives us the following straight line equation. So plotting the primary variables, the X intercept becomes the oil in place and the y-intercept is 1 over B pseudo steady state, which is also the productivity index. And if we take a look at this graphically, we can see that we've plotted the rate divided by delta P versus the cumulative production divided by delta P. And we call these variables the normalized rate and the normalized cumulative production. And so the plot of normalized rate versus normalized cumulative production gives us a straight line and extrapolates down to the oil in place. So therefore, using this methodology, we've now determined the original oil in place by using flowing pressures and have not had to shut in the well. Here is an example of a flowing material balance for oil, 
This is real production data and, like discussed, is a plot of normalised rate versus normalised cumulative production. To generate the estimate of oil in place, we focus on the stabilised or boundary dominated flow portion of the data. And then we draw a line of best fit through those points and extrapolating this gives us the oil in place. So the discussion of the FMB up until this point has focused on single phase and constant compressibility fluids such as oil. Later we'll be taking a look at the multi-phase FMB which has been developed to allow for the changes in fluid properties. But for now, let's take a look at the corrections for gas reservoirs that allow us to apply FMB for gas. When dealing with gas reservoirs, fluid properties vary with pressure much more than oil and can vary very significantly. Specifically, we're talking Z-factor, compressibility and viscosity. With this in mind, we need to make some corrections of our oil formulation in order for the methodology to be applied for gas. Now, when we look at the boundary dominated flow equation, there are two components there. We have the depletion term and the reservoir flow term. The depletion term depends heavily on compressibility and in oil, we had to assume that that was constant, but for gas, we can't do that. The reservoir flow term depends on viscosity and Z factor, and we need to account for these changes in properties. Let's now talk about the Darcy flow term or reservoir flow term first. Darcy's law states that delta P is proportional to rate, but for gas wells, this is not true because there's a variation with viscosity and Z factor with pressure. We solve this problem by using pseudo pressure. Pseudo pressure is a well established method that has been used in well testing for years and is a direct transformation. For gas wells, all we have to do is replace pressure by pseudo pressure. The depletion term, or the correction that we have to do for the material balance term, is a little bit more complex and actually more important. Specifically, what we're dealing with here is a variation in compressibility. And we find that for gas reservoirs, compressibility varies hugely with reservoir pressure. And there's an inverse relationship between the two. When we get into very low reservoir pressures, compressibility gets very large very quickly. So we need to have a way of accounting for compressibility changes through time. And the solution that we have for this is called pseudo time. Pseudo time works by incorporating compressibility and actually viscosity as well, because viscosity changes with pressure as well. So it incorporates both of these terms into one time function and it simplifies the problem for us. It does need to be noted here that in pseudo time, compressibility and viscosity need to be evaluated at average reservoir pressure. And this isn't to be confused with well test pseudo time, which evaluates properties at well bore flowing pressure. So the overall boundary dominated flow equation for gas looks very similar to the boundary dominated flow equation for oil, except that we're substituting pseudo variables for their equivalent variables. So wherever we have a pressure, we put pseudo pressure and wherever we see time, we replace it with pseudo time. And we can follow the same logic we did for oil reservoirs and turn this into a variable rate capable equation. And note that rate times time is equal to cumulative production. So now we have a boundary dominated flow equation that's applicable to gas reservoirs with their changes in properties and is applicable to variable rate and constant rate. Just like for oil, we can manipulate this equation into a form that's easily plottable. And we do this by plotting the normalized rate versus normalized cumulative production. And we have a straight line through the data, which leads to the original gas in place, as we can see here. So now we'll take a look at the procedure for doing a gas flowing material balance. The first step is very simple. All we need to do is convert pressures to pseudo pressures. And this methodology dates back to the mid 1960s when it was solved by Al Husseini and Ramey when they introduced the gas pseudo pressure function. The next step is a little bit more complicated and we need to convert time into pseudo time. This is well documented in the literature with the first formulation being proposed by Agarwal Gardner in 1979. So in order to calculate pseudo time, we first need to find out what the viscosity and compressibility are at average reservoir pressure at each time step. And to do that, we just use the gas material balance equation. 
Then we can calculate pseudo time and what we call pseudo cumulative production, which is just a cumulative production based on pseudo time. The next step is to plot the variables. So we plot the normalized rate versus normalized cumulative production. And with real data, it will look something like this. We then pick the straight line portion of this data and fit a line through it and extrapolate this line down to the original gas in place. Now that procedure seems quite straightforward, but there is a bit of a problem with it. And the problem is that in order to calculate pseudo time, we need to know what the original gas in place is before we even begin. And that's because the average reservoir pressure needed at each point in time required to determine the compressibility and viscosity is actually determined by the size of the tank or the gas in place. And this is what we're trying to work out in the first place. Now, since the gas in place is required for the calculations, and since this is what we're trying to find out in the first place, this procedure is actually iterative in nature. And there's loads of literature that supports this premise, and pseudo time really is the standard procedure now for calculating gas in place when using flowing pressure and rate data. So now we'll take a look at a real life example of a gas flowing material balance and go through the process of iterations. Before we even begin, we need an estimate of the gas in place, and in this case, it's 1.7 BCF, and that can be the gas produced so far. So using this value of gas in place, we can go through the procedure for calculating gas pseudo time and the pseudo cumulative production and plot normalized rate versus normalized cumulative production. And we get a straight line that extrapolates to a new estimate of gas in place, which in this case is 2.2 BCF. So this new estimate of gas in place, which is 2.2 BCF, is now used in the next iteration. And so we plot the new normalized rate versus normalized cumulative production, which we can see in blue. And we can see that the position of the data points has actually shifted from the previous gas in place in green. And that's because the pseudo time function has actually changed due to the new gas in place being used in the calculation. And the result of this iteration now extrapolates to a gas in place of 2.4 BCF. In the third and final iteration, we can see the convergence of our gas in place being the same as what we extrapolated to in our previous analysis. With convergence happening, the analysis is complete and the gas in place is 2.4 BCF. Now, typically convergence is very quick and might only take a couple of iterations and then you have the answer. When using software though, you don't notice this and it appears to be automatic. So now we've gone through the procedure for evaluating a flowing material balance. What I'd like to stress is that when we use software to do the procedure, it becomes very simple and painless as all the iterations are internal to the program and so you can do the analysis very quickly. The other advantages are that if you have static reservoir pressures, these can be overlaid and you can compare the FMB and the traditional material balance results on the same plot. In Harmony Enterprise, the results from all the different types of analysis can be quickly compared and then populated into models directly, which simplifies what's required to do when performing a workflow. Workflows can then be saved and applied to other wells or shared with colleagues, which makes using the software super time efficient and allows for consistency of analysis between wells and also between colleagues. So let's now take a look at the multi-phase FMB. Now the multi-phase FMB parallels the single phase methodology and it uses the same format of equations but it replaces pressure by a pseudo pressure that accounts for the variations in PVT properties, saturation changes, relative permeability and individual flowing phases. So this means that we can determine the hydrocarbons in place for multi-phase fluids including injection by using flowing pressure and production rate without the need to shut in the wells. So to do this, we take the FMB equation for a single phase and we convert the pressures to a pseudo pressure that accounts for those variations in PVT, saturation, relative permeability and flowing phases. Where did those equations come from? Now up to this point in the presentation, we've seen the flowing material balance equation in the following form. And this is made up of combining material balance equation with the productivity index equation. Now to give us an equation that's applicable for multi-phase FMB, we can now modify this equation and we can get it in this form shown here. These two equations are identical, but they're in slightly different forms. We now plot the normalized rate on the x-axis and we get the oil in place, 
and the y-intercept gives us the productivity index. This term on the x-axis is a bit of a complicated term. You'll notice that it includes n, which is the oil in place, and this is what we're looking for. So how do we plot this term here? We just use the iterations again in a similar way to how we did with the gas corrections. As we start talking about how this pseudo pressure is defined, we'll first take a look at how we calculate pseudo pressure for single phase oil. And it's very similar to how we calculate pseudo pressure for gas, which we've already been through. Now for oil, in the traditional formulation of the FMB, we made the assumption that the viscosity, compressibility and formation volume factor are constant with pressure. What we can now do is use a pseudo pressure term, which is the integral that we see here, to account for the variable PVT and permeability. And the advantage of this term, similar to gas, is that it can be evaluated in advance. When we come to multiphase though, things get a little bit more complicated. The definition that we need for pseudo pressure, if we compare to the single phase one, is quite similar except that it contains the relative permeability to oil or relative permeability to gas or water and we need to include those terms in there as well. So what's the difference between the black oil formulation and the volatile oil formulation? If you take a look at the integrals for the volatile oil, when you look at the first term, there is oil itself flowing. And the second term is the oil that comes from the gas. It has to flow too. The RV in this term is the amount of oil or condensate in the gas. That's the difference between the two, but overall the principle is the same. Now the problem with this method is that we can't calculate this in advance because this integration dictates that all these terms are dependent on pressure. But relative permeability, we know, doesn't depend on pressure. It depends on saturation. So somehow we need to convert this dependence of relative permeability on saturation to a dependence on pressure so that we can do this integration. And the way we do this is to flow the well and calculate the pseudo pressure for that flow situation. So for every point in time, we have the flowing pressure that's measured, the flowing rates, and hence we know the gas oil ratio. From the gas oil ratio, we can then use this equation here. And that calculates the relative permeability ratios. And we can also do the same thing for water oil ratios to get the relative permeability ratios. With these relative permeability ratios, we can then go to the relative permeability curves and get the saturations for every point in time. So simply by using the production data, we can get a pressure saturation curve and relative permeability is incorporated into the pseudo pressure. And now we have the correct definition of pseudo pressure. Now the plot on the left is the single phase FMB, which assumes constant fluid properties. The plot on the right is the multi-phase flowing material balance, and it looks exactly the same, but the way we're going to evaluate it is that we assume N. Remember, we don't know what it is that we're trying to look for, but we guess the N, and this data will plot somewhere around. And when we get the correct N, they line up in a nice straight line, which will extrapolate down to our original oil in place. Now, as part of the Harmony Enterprises Flowing Material Balance module, we also have the FMB model. This model has two purposes. The first is for history matching, and the second is for reservoir group identification. The FMB model uses the pseudo productivity index and material balance equations in reverse to help with these functions. Now, the history matching uses the pseudo productivity index to match the rates, the flowing pressure and the average reservoir pressure, as well as the material balance equation to match the average reservoir pressure. For reservoir group identification, the plot can be used to identify wells that are in the same reservoir and the ones that are in separate reservoirs. So, under stable flowing conditions, wells in the same reservoir will have the same common average reservoir pressure within their drainage areas as a function of time and the software will provide the diagnostic methods to help identify if two or more wells are in the same reservoir or if they're in different reservoirs. So how do we do this? Firstly looking at the FMB model for history matching. You'll remember that the FMB consists of two parts, the material balance equation and the productivity index. We combine these two terms and plot them in this way and they end up with the oil in place and the productivity index. So now we have the productivity index and we have N, so we can determine the average reservoir pressure. 
Now, when I know my average reservoir pressure, I can use PI, which I also know, and my flowing pressures in order to allow me to model my rate. And that will then allow me to history match my rates. Similar, again, if I know my PI, I know my average reservoir pressure and I know my rates, I can then back calculate this and figure out what my flowing pressure will be and model my flowing pressure. And when I do that, that will allow me to history match my flowing pressures. And we can use the same methodology for reservoir group identification. So to start off with, we'll take a look at the productivity index again. So what can we do? Again, we know what our productivity index is, we know our flowing pressure, and we know our rate. And so we can back calculate into the equation and allow us to model our average reservoir pressure. Similarly, we can use the material balance equation. We know what our N is, and we know some of the parameters in the material balance equation. We can put those in, back calculate, and that will allow us to model our average reservoir pressure. So this allows another way of history matching the FMB, but also by doing this process for wells that are suspected to be in the same reservoir, we can compare these calculated average reservoir pressures, and if they track each other with time, we have a very strong indication that wells are part of the same reservoir. Now we have a load of references here for your reference, which supports this methodology for multi-phase flowing material balance and for flowing material balance. So now let's jump back into the software for our final example. And this is just showing how the multi-phase flowing material balance is used in the Harmony Enterprise software. Now I've jumped back into the software to take a look at an example of multi-phase FMB. Now I have an oil well here which is producing above the bubble point and I've selected my flowing material balance so you can see my plot of normalized rate versus normalized cumulative production here. You can see that when I've not selected the material balance option for this oil well there's a deviation from my line of best fit and this is because it's not taking into account the changes in my oil properties. However, when I select to turn on my multi-phase option, which remember uses a pseudo pressure to take into account changes in PVT, relative permeability and saturation changes, you can see that brings everything back into line. Now people tend to ask, what are these changes? So if we go into my editors tab, you can actually see the effect of these relative permeabilities here. And we can see how we actually convert from single phase to multi-phase and how it takes into consideration the relative permeabilities and the relationships between the ratios, such as the water-oil ratio, as we can see here, gas-oil ratios for each of the phases that we have there. Now, the saturation endpoints for the relative permeability curves are used to determine the initial fluids in place in addition to allowing us to model the flow behavior. And you can view the three phase saturations and the relative permeabilities at different saturations here in the editors tab. We know that the oil compressibility and the oil viscosity also change with pressure. So these need to be taken into account as well. And the multi-phase FMB, if I go back to the model, takes into account all of those changes in the reservoir properties, both above and below the bubble point, and also for gas condensate wells going below the dew point. So once again, if I turn off the multi-phase option, you can see that deviation. But however, when I put on the multi-phase, you can see how it brings everything back in line. And now here's another example where it's super clear. Now we can see where the well starts to fall below the bubble point. And when I turn that multi-phase option on, it all comes into line nicely. And another thing that you can see here is when you talk about the multi-phase, remember I said that we also have a flowing material balance model or an FMB model. And there are three things that we can match the data to, the rates, the flowing pressures, and the average pressures. And these are three super useful options within the FMB model that can help you to do that history match with your multi-phase. Now, the final example I have here is step changes. Now we can see from the FMB here, that we have obvious step changes with this oil well. And it's almost impossible to place that line to fit through the data here. 
So we have that multi-phase option, which when I select, you can see brings everything back into line and it will give us a good estimation of our original oil in place. So that concludes today's webinar. Thank you for tuning in. And in the final webinar of this series, We'll take a look at an introduction to modelling using analytical and numerical models, as well as taking a look at some multi-well modelling.